All right, welcome to the conversation on the TYT Network. we got two great guests for you right now. Uh, Margaret Klein-Solomon is the co-founder and director of Climate Mobilization. She's also written a book, uh, Facing the Climate Emergency, How to Transform Yourself with Climate Truth. And also joining us, Adam McKay, who's on the advisory board of the Climate Mobilization. And he's also was the head writer for Saturday Night Live, uh, co-wrote the films Anchorman, Talladega Nights, the other uh, guys, Big Short, The Vice. We could be here all day. Okay. So, um, welcome both of you. Um, uh, let me start with you, Margaret, on what is climate mobilization? The Climate Mobilization is an advocacy organization that calls for World War II scale mobilization of our economy and society in response to the climate emergency. And we do a variety of campaigns based on the idea that we as a society need to confront the truth of how advanced the climate emergency is in order to be able to mount an effective response. And Adam, uh, what's your sense of how much the media recognizes how advanced it is? You know, I think it's gotten better in the past three or four years, but I ultimately feel like our media, as it's constituted now, isn't equipped to deal with the enormity of this issue. It just doesn't fit into any kind of box of ratings and advertising and kind of the pleasant hue that rests under 90% of our media. So, you know, that's what drew me to the work that Margaret's doing with her group is I really felt like they had the proper footing. They were, they were addressing this as an imperative, an actual emergency, as opposed to one of a coterie of issues to be talked about by candidates. Yeah, Adam, let me uh, stay on with you, uh, for, with you for a second. Uh, you know, the other day I was just thinking, one of the issues is that if if it takes two steps to get to anything, the media is out. Um, you know, corruption, well, the person gets the money, the campaign contributions, etc., and then they do something bad. Oh, man, I got to explain that I'm out, right? And, and it feels like, uh, cl whereas, like, uh, they are covering George Floyd story, which is great. Uh, very, very important because police brutality in this country is so overwhelming, so uh, real, and, and and must be addressed. But it's one step. You can see. You see the guy dies on camera, right? Um, does climate change have that problem, Adam, that it's two steps? That, oh, okay, we're putting all this carbon in the air. That leads to climate change. And then we know that it's causing extreme weather, but... For the media, they then have to say, maybe we have more severe hurricanes because of it, et cetera. Is that a huge part of the problem here? Yeah. I mean, I think it goes back to the fact that most of our culture is based on selling. We live in a constant culture of, you know, you have to make the customer feel right. So the comparison would be that if you went into like an Abercrombie & Fitch or a you know, department store, and they were blaring Metallica when you walked through the front door and right away the salesman told you, you know, we're all going to die. Life can be a dark place. Now would you like to buy some shoes? So I think just the kind of scope of the story is so dramatic and so dire. And like Margaret says, really the closest comparisons we have are like the eruption of Krakatoa and World War II. And most of the news nowadays is about the commercials. And they have to kind of stay in this half balance of like being pleasant or entertaining. Even with the story you're seeing now in Minneapolis, you've got footage of riots. You've got drama going on. You can sell that. And like you said, with uh, global warming, it's, it is still somewhat abstract. You're right. There's some steps to connect it, and they're not pleasant steps. But we need to be chewing through these purposes of selling and having shows that get viewers. You know, you wouldn't say we're not going to announce that Zero's just bombed Hawaii because that's a bummer story, and we want to go to Dinah Shore singing some songs. You do it because it has to be done. Um, and the, really, the first time I started hearing that tone in an organization was Margaret's group. There's some other great groups out there that have done amazing work, but I happen to connect with Margaret's group first, and they really get that. Yeah. 
Uh, although I'm a little different. So if you told me uh, that there's an existential threat and we don't have uh, long to live, I'd buy a lot of sneakers. <laughs> <laughs> and so, I do look like Metallica, don't get me wrong. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right, Margaret, you're a climate psychologist. What does that mean? It means I'm a clinical psychologist, uh, you know, doing one-on-one -on -one therapy, earning my PhD in New York City when I started to have uh, increasing amount of climate anxiety and really uh, terror. And I realized that though I loved being a therapist, it's a wonderful career. Um, it, it just, you know, helping one person at a time isn't gonna cut it during this just absolute global catastrophe. So I switched my focus to, let's say, doing therapy on the whole world uh, or as many people as possible because we're, we're acting totally um, insane and suicidal at, at the moment. And so, so I think some of the tools of psychotherapy um, can be just what we need. Yeah, you know, it's interesting because uh, there's a couple of angles here. One is how people are coping, which you deal with, uh, but also the fact that we've lost our minds collectively. Uh, you know, Adam and I, in, in a previous interview, were talking about if all the scientists in the world told us a meteor was going to hit, we wouldn't be like, ah, whatever, who cares, right? On right. the other hand, now having lived through coronavirus, we might. Yeah. <laughs> you know, now you, that all the scientists in the world could tell you to wear a mask, and if Trump says don't, you might not. So what, what do you make of this collective insanity of not wanting to deal with something that, is, that literally every scientist is saying is definitely coming and is already here and is going to devastate us? Right. So there's several really important factors. Obviously, there's the multi-billion dollar campaign of lies and mis misinformation waged very successfully by the fossil fuel industry. But there's so I mean, it's always important to, to remember that this this kind of mass denial didn't just happen. It was paid for. But but so what that denial campaign and the media silence have allowed to happen is a pluralistic ignorance, or you could say like a whole culture of denial in which people look at each other and say, well, my neighbor is acting normal and my brother's acting normal and my friends and colleagues, they're all, that, they're all going about their lives and planning their families and their careers and their retirements and their vacations. And it gives people the terribly false impression that that things are fine because because people evaluate risk socially not rationally so we have this um yeah kind of vortex of uh normal no, it's living our lives as normal while the biosphere is just collapsing so adam what do you think the average person should be doing? I mean, it, it's it, we are in this bizarre situation where we literally have an existential threat, uh, not like a hyperbole, not something politicians made up, uh, and we're all going on with our lives as if it's not going to happen or it's not already happening. So I know what a politician can do, I know what the government can do, but what can an individual do to react to that? What I love about Margaret's book is that's the level she takes it to. It's very easy for us to walk around and be saying, can you believe these people are denying science? How can they be this dumb? And why is this happening? But I think until this discussion is framed as you're, as you're doing in a personal context, you have to picture someone who's at a family barbecue and everyone at the barbecue is denying global warming, not talking about it. And what does that person need inside of themselves to be the person that brings it up, knowing that they're going to be shot down, knowing that they're going to be countered? Maybe it's even a barbecue where people acknowledge global warming, but it's a bummer conversation. How do you cross that line personally? And I honestly think, yes, there's a lot of activist work that needs to happen. We need to get politicians in who fully acknowledge the scope of this catastrophe, but the real change is going to happen the way real change always happens. And it's going to happen inside of each person. Uh, 
So I, she, you know, Margaret does a great job of kind of laying out the steps in this book, which is why I really think it's going to become like a manual over the next five, 10, 20 years of how to acknowledge this, how to stop being in denial, how to feel the feelings that come with this recognition, and then how to get your feet back on the ground and be in a position of action. The book is called uh, Facing the Climate Emergency, How to Transform Yourself with Climate Truth. The organization is Climate Mobilization, Margaret Klein Salomon and Adam McKay. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Really, really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thanks for watching this free clip of the Young Turks. Don't forget to become a TYT member today. For more exclusive content, join now at tyt.com slash join.